Um, Samtech looks at signal integrity holistically. Um, we look at it from the transmitter all the way to the receiver on any signal path. Now, on you know, for for conversations, you know, for the, for the for use case here, you know, we're showing a transmitter on a on a motherboard with two coplanar connectors going to a component board to a receiver on the other side. That channel could be board to board. This could be on the same PCB. This could you know, those connectors could be cables, but when you look at that channel holistically, there's a number of subcomponents that are part of it. So it's not just the transmitter, the silicon, but it's also, you know, how does that, how does that signal get, get from the die down to the substrate, down to the, the, the IC package, um, you know, going from the package through the, the solder ball down to the PCB. How's that, tr that signal go to the PCB trace on the PCB? How many layers does it go through? Are there vias, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it gets to a connector breakout region. You know, BOR is a Samtech term for breakout region. Um, uh, other terms you may have, have ter you have heard related to that may include the signal launch. But how does that connect? How does that signal get into or out of the connector? How does it pass through the connector? Uh, you know, the same thing on the backside. I have the breakout region on the receive board, the PCB trace, the package, the substrate, the die, and then the receiver itself. So there's any number of components, subcomponents across the whole channel that affect the entire signal integrity uh, of, of, the, uh, the, of the challenge that you're working on. So we're gonna try to look at, we're gonna try to define each of these in detail while also going into some of the basic SI parameters um, that can help you to troubleshoot, at least initially, uh, some of the uh, SI challenges you may face and then also you know, the resources that may be available to help you do that. So, you know, when I came to Samtech, I just sort of assumed high speed world digital zeros and ones and signals were perfect um, because that's kind of the, what I dealt with in the earlier part of my career when, you know, dealing at megabits, per, you know, megabits per second or maybe a few hundred megabits per second. Um, however, you know, when I came to Samtech, I started getting into 28, 56, 112, now 224. And you start to realize that those digital signals um, obviously have frequency components in them. So one of the terms I was reintroduced to um, here at Samtech is Nyquist rate or Nyquist frequency. Kind of forgot about that from my undergrad years. But the Nyquist rate is designed as, is defined as the frequency that's twice the bandwidth, or typically frequency is, is twice the bandwidth in high speed designs. Right, the majority of the signal energy is at Nyquist, although many other frequency components exist to create a digital signal. Um, so if you look at the illustration there on the right, the upper right, you know, that shows a realistic zero to one transition and a one to zero transition, but you're also going to have, excuse me a second. I apologize, this technical was driving me crazy. Anyway, um, you're going to see these transitions that are going to be driven by rise time, right? And, and rise time, obviously, traditionally defined as, you know, the transition from you know, if you're going from zero to 3.3, you know, 10% of that signal to 90% of that signal. The, the faster the rise time, the faster the fall, the, the fall time, the more frequency component that you're going to have. Um, you're also going to have potentially noise on the system, overshoot, undershoot, uh, and the like. Uh, plus the fact that you look at the pulse duration of the signal. So it's not just a pure DC component. It's not perfect going from zero to BCC or from BCC to zero but you're going to have frequency components in it that add to the noise. Um, in addition, we start to look at what type of signals we have. Are you know, there's single-ended signals, there's, there's differential. We'll talk about those in just a moment. Single-ended signals, single point-to-point -point connection requires the ground reference to return current to the source, prone to noise. Obviously, single-ended signals are, are very prevalent in a number of embedded designs, uh, a number of standard protocols across the embedded ecosystem, SDI, Coax Express, RS-232, I squared C, SPI, RF control signals, all take advantage of uh, single-ended solutions. Um, but does that mean that we can run single, if we wanna run, if we wanna run tens of gigabits or hundreds of gigabits per second, does that mean that we look at single-ended? More often than not, when you when you get above a certain performance rate, you're going to turn to differential pairs. 
And the reason you look at differential pairs is because of the inherent structure of the transceivers and the receivers help to eliminate noise in the system. Uh, differential pairs were introduced to create coupling immunity on transmission lines. You can see here, uh, you have a source, you have a pulse on the plus and minus subtractor, you get an out output pulse. Um, it does require 2x the amount of conductors, so that is a drawback uh, requiring extra space, but it's it's such standard practice in high-speed communication, especially embedded, that it's just become the norm. Um, on the other side, if you do get noise on both the positive and the minus, the subtractor, the comparator, if you will, uh, removes the noise from the system. So it's not a foolproof, it's not a foolproof, and it's not just as easy going from single-ended to differential pair, but as you get higher and higher speeds, differential pair signals obviously provide uh, inherent uh, signal integrity improvements over single and its signals because of the, uh, the principles that we just showed. Similarly, um, you know, additional advantages differential pair because a positive negative signal are transmitted, the net current is zero. There's no return line uh, required. Again, you can see here that you have a pulse train. There's also some noise, uh, but when we pass it through, uh, when you pass it through um, the circuitry, the noise is removed from the system. Um, differential pairs are used to cancel common mode noise. So it doesn't eliminate all noise in the system, which we'll talk about. We'll look at some other techniques uh, that can help us to do that, uh, but uh, it does help. It's also important to keep differential pairs close together so that they couple uh, the same noise. Sorry, there's a typo there. Somehow I messed that up. So we talked about single ended. We've talked about we've talked about differential pairs. Something else we're going to talk about too is is, is impedance matching um, and how that affects signal integrity. If you look at this uh, basic uh, circuit, uh, we want to make sure that the in essence, the the load of the, the the impedance load is the same as the impedance of the source. Matching the source load gives the maximum power uh, possible power output, which uh, equals high efficiency. Um, you want to make sure that the impedance of the RLC circuit on the source is the same. Excuse me, on the load is the same as the source. Matching for SI involves balancing the impedance. Um, there's going to be, you know, we'll talk about this as we go forward, but throughout a signal channel that we've talked about holistically going from the transmitter to the receiver. In an ideal world, it's all the same impedance, but you don't have ideal impedance matching across a real world channel. Um, so you're going to have mismatches, but it's how do you minimize those mismatches? When you do have the impedance mismatch, lower power due to uh, mismatch in high speed circuits can cause issues or not. Um, what does that mean? We'll, we'll cover that as we go forward. Uh, these two, sh these two, um, graphs show, uh, how you can have an impedance mismatches within the system. Um, this is using, uh, TDR time domain reflectometry, basically set up a pulse down the signal. And then as it comes back, you, you measure the, 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 the impedance of the channel, uh, using TDR signal, signals, signal sections, the, um, Channel on the left uh, shows an example of two TDRs in a PCI system, one at 85 ohm, one at 100 ohm. Uh, the physical locations on the bottom of the graph, their subsequent effect on the characteristic impedance. The graph shows larger discontinuities at, at 100 ohms. Um, you may ask, well, what's the difference between 185 ohms? And, and depending upon the protocols that you look at, there, there are a number of protocols that are 100 ohm impedance. There's PCI uses 85 ohm impedance. Um, but you can see how impedance mismatches can really affect your TDR. Um, TDRs are never going to be flat because there's always going to be discontinuities when a signal leaves the source and then goes through the interconnect. So when you look at, uh, you know, all this movement here in the beginning, tend to not pay attention to that, but this is bad. You know, so when you see TDR changes further along the signal, you want to minimize that. And this helps us to see why in a number of cases, 85 ohm routing is preferable, but not every system uses it. Um, so this is using a standard PCI express form factor. Obviously that is 
uh, you know, PCI Express, Interconnect have been on the market for 15 to 20 years. Um, they're uh, a standard point one millimeter connector uh, using standard FR4 material because we won't cost high volume. But when you look at the uh, when you look at the uh, graph on the right, the difference is you know looking. This is an example. We use a Samtech Novaray connector. Samtech Novaray was designed specifically specifically for differential pair high speed at one twelve and two twenty four. It has very good crosstalk. It has very good. It was designed for high speed differential pairs. So when you look at TDR, it has a intrinsic impedance of ninety two point five ohms. Um, it's it's much flatter uh, in terms of TDR response. You're going to have better impedance matching on this interconnect than making the transition from a PCI Express connector to a PCB uh, because of the fact that it's designed for higher speeds. But the key takeaway from these uh, the t the key takeaway from this slide is that impedance mismatch, you lose power in the system. It adds uh, attenuation and you want to try to optimize matching with throughout the system as best as possible.